Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our presentation of the results for the our year ended 31st of March 2017 and a report on the general health of our company. Uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces and very nice to see new faces. Welcome, everybody. My name is Bernard Johnson. I sometimes forget it, but uh, I'm the group managing director and I'll make a few introductory remarks here to set the, the tone, but uh, our, our main presentation will be from Paul uh, Foster, our um, Managing Director of, of uh, Manufacturing. He has been for some time our uh, Director of Finance, but he's moved on to take more responsibility, but he's well positioned to um, uh, do this presentation on finance. And then Pippa, our, Pippa Clark, our, our group uh, sales and marketing director will take over to present the mechanics of how we actually achieve the results that Paul will have spoken about. So without uh, further ado, I'll, I'll sort of paint a little background on our, on our company. We're a health and beauty company with uh, 15,000 doors, or, or we, we supply product to 15,000 outlets. We supply branded product, licensed brands. We supply retailer brands, that is brands we manufacture for Tesco and Asda and other high street retailers. And we supply to brand owners themselves. We actually develop, design, manufacture and distribute to the brand owners, the major retailers. And we do our own uh, brands ourselves. We develop our own brands and design them. We. Uh, continue to increase the channels into which we put these, these brands, hair care to high-end fragrance and everywhere in between really, tanning, skin care, uh, and so on. We continue, our main thing is to push the boundaries of technical capabilities for a company our size and for the markets we're in. And we strive to reach the cutting edge of product performance and quality at good value uh, retail. And just as an aside, we continue to export 10% of our, our, our business is export. So as our business grows to 30 million, 3 million of that is into the export market. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Paul to give you the background on our finances. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Bernard, and a uh, oh, quick welcome from myself. What, what I'll do today is I'll go through the, uh, the, the highlights of the preliminary announcement that came out earlier on today and then flesh it out and go through a few slides just showing you and, and flesh out the results really, just give you a bit more background to how we achieved that. So moving on, the highlights, you know, revenues increased by 46% up to 30 million pound, nearly 10 million pounds worth of growth in revenue. Um, the, the, I'll talk a little bit about the split of that later on. We then got an uh, operating profit that's grown by 171%, a significant growth, far greater than the growth in turnover, to 1.5 million in the year, fairly healthy improvement. Our operating margin has, stay, has increased again from 2.7% 4, 4, well, 2016 up to 4.9% this year. And looking back, if you look behind the numbers, the gross margins held fairly static, slight improvement on the previous year. So, so the gross margin, the growth delivered, we've increased the operating margin through the control on costs a bit more later on again. And a significant point, we've generated £1.2 million worth in cash in that year in operational, as a result of that operational performance. From shareholders' perspective, the earnings per share has grown by over a pound a share. So on a diluted level, we've significantly grown the earnings per share for shareholders. And for the first time, we're proposing a dividend to shareholders um, at our next general meeting. Um, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about all of these as we go through the presentation. Five years of figures here, four years of underlying growth shown on that figure of turnover. 
As a background, we've excluded from these figures the sales from the two brands we sold, the Twisted Sister brand in 2015 and the Real Shaving Company brand in 2016. So those figures have been excluded from the revenue lines all the way through. So they're slightly lower going back from where we are. But I thought that was important to show that despite selling from way back in 2013, the equivalent of two and a half million pounds worth of turnover, we've continued to grow the business over that period. And we've also had the massive increase. I'm exaggerating there, I don't know. A massive increase in the last 10 years. In the last year with 10 million pounds uh, coming up approximately. Of that 10 million, just a bit of background, about 7 million of that was leveraging the assets of the business we bought um, in February 2016. And the rest of it is what I would characterise genuine organic growth from our existing customer base and new customers that we've won and that expansion into export markets. So, and I've given an example in 20 March 13 there that 2.5 million of sales has been taken out of there. So there's 17.3 in that year reported. Moving on to operating profit, and that's where they see the steep increase. Um, the again looking at from 330,000 to 1.5 million in the year, uh, t four years, so underlying growth every year. Looks a bit flat in the middle, but I'll come on to that. And 171% growth in that last, last year. And I think that growth in the last year illustrates the impact of t our tight cost control within the business and also impact about the way we've been able to utilize our existing resources to utilize the, re the capability we've acquired. Um, March 14, 15, profit stayed reasonably flat in that year and was a, very, a result of a very conscious decision by the company that when we sold those brands and those assets, we did not, consciously did not cut back on the resources. We made sure we kept the people in place, the sales teams, the teams that would deliver those sales and reallocated the resources to look for the future growth in the business. And I think that was a decision that may have impacted on those years a little bit in terms of profitability, but is certainly starting to pay dividends as we go on now. We've got a couple of slides here on, on, on profit. Um, I've done the net profit excluding the exceptional items. Again, it shows a similar trend earlier on. The main difference here, um, the pre-exceptional items again, the main difference between here and the 1.5 and is the 1.5 and the 1.25 million we're talking about there. And that's largely because for the first time in many, many years, um, Crichton's as a group will now have to pay a corporation tax. So many years we've been sheltered from corporation tax. Um, so there's a sort of 17% charge in this year as we utilise the last of those losses and the tax rate will normalise going forward. Moving on to the profit after tax, as reported in the accounts, including the exceptional profits uh, from the sales. So we look at, in the March 2016, we sold the Real Shaving Company brand, um, generated a profit of 768,000 in that year, which took the reported profit up to 1.33 million. And again, in March 15, it, we sold our 55% stake in the Twisted Sister brand and generated £375,000 in profit. Uh, and, and I think um, a little bit later on, Pippa will show a, a graph showing the mix of share business between the various aspects of our business. But what that does do is it underlines the value of our brands. There is, we are developing brands from ground up that do have a market presence and do have a value. So we're not just. In fact, we don't consider ourselves a manufacturer. We consider ourselves a solution provider, a brand provider that is in manufacturing as well. So I think it's important to get that message across. And again, I think people will uh, talk about that later. Next slide is looking at margin, the, the bottom line. Um, and that's where we've seen an operating margin increase to 4.9% in the year. And we've done that by, I think, just looking at the tight control of costs. We've expanded the business by 10 million pounds, we've kept the costs under control. We've used the assets we had available within the existing business. The senior management team, some of whom are here today, now take a broader span of control across both sites. And that flows across the senior, the middle management team in the company. So as the, you know, the, 
the people who are involved in packaging development, MPD, the senior people have now got a broader span of control looking after two sites. So it, I think it's a testament to the people that they've managed to broaden their shoulders, take on more resource, more responsibility, and manage to deliver that increased growth. Um, and then there's, you know, so there's been a lot of synergies that have come through from, and there's also been synergies come through from centralised functions, HR, uh, payroll, procurement, planning, are all now centralised uh, um, in Peterborough. Um, so we, we've taken a, you know, a, a significant increase. We've, we've done what we should have done. We've leveraged the assets. We've generated increased return on, on the profit. Second slide, effectively the same thing, but just illustrating that £238,000 tax charge. Um, and it's a 4.1% um, margin. I've put that up there partly to illustrate that, that that's the metric we measure ourselves on now. It's, a, it's one of our key met KPIs, is the, the, the margin after tax. Um, and it, it's important just to see that, that, you know, we, I think again, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Moving on to... Another key metric that we're starting to look at how we measure is the return on capital employed. Again, we've adjusted this, and it's a very simple, simplistic adjustment. We've just taken the profit out of the um, of the exceptional profit out of the revenue line, and we uh, the sorry profit line, and we've taken it out of the net assets and recalculated the return on capital employed. So that uh, it, it won't be a figure that you will see in any sort of formal metric, but it shows that we are have significantly improved on the underlying operations of the business, the return on capital employed in the period. The 8.8% in the, in the previous two years just shows that the, if we strip out the impact of the sales, we've generated cash, we've not necessarily utilised that fully, um, but holding on to that cash and then making the investment we did do has paid dividends in terms of the significant improvement in return on capital employed uh, in the final year. And it's a sort of it's significant, as you say, you can see the, uh, uh, you know, a ret increase of what, 68% between the two years. I also showed the, the, the pure return on capital employed here. And it shows the figures of 15.1, 18.6% in the two previous years. So that's what we'll see as a shareholder, we'll see a decrease this year, but of course those figures include the exceptional profit. But from your shareholder point of view, it shows the value when we do sell a brand that there is a significant return on the capital employed that's been built up in those brands over the period. And, and a little point at the end, that the net assets of the company has gone up by 82% over that year, over that period. But the earnings per share, again, key metric for everybody here. And we're seeing it at 1.8, virtually a pound increase year on year. Um, so um, a small decrease between 14 and 15. And frankly, that was uh, di management dilution was the reason for that. We had a slight increase in profits, but the earnings per share diluted as uh, management were issued with some shares. But then we're seeing the benefit. Hopefully, you can see the benefit in terms of what that uh, incentivization has done to the management team in the results. You know, and that's significant, 269% uh, over that four year period. Cash. Um, again, we've seen a, st a steady improvement in the cash position in the group. Um, it's, it, we've generated 1.2 million in the current year, 0.9 million the previous year. And in both those years, um, albeit the, nine, the, uh, the previous year in 2016, there will have been some cash from the generation of the, from the realisation of the real shaving company asset. We also spent £600,000 on that year in buying those assets in in Devon and we also again spent £200,000 the following year on, on the, the sort of finalising some more assets that were um, owned by HP companies etc. So, so we spent about 800000 on those assets in the Devon site which we then leveraged to give the significant growth and in the current year we've continued to generate cash um, at a good rate which puts us in a strong position for the future. I just wanted to, at this point, is almost illustrating a little bit about we are a careful company, we're careful on costs, we're careful on managing our assets. It would have been all too easy with management distractions and times to lose control of the fundamentals of the business. And I think this, inter this shows that it doesn't. I mean, we've kept a tight control on working capital across the business. Our stock went up by 100,000 in that year. Our turnover went up by um, 46%, 3%, 46%. A significant ratio. 
A lot of that was hard work with the team, keeping the stock under control. Some of it sells makes the, the, the a lot of the businesses are made to fork made to order business out of the Devon site, so we don't have to hold stock to service the Tesco's and Asda's on a call off basis. But but it is a, a a significant achievement without moving forward. So the stock turn's gone up to four point four times, less than three months now, um, compared to um, three three times the year before. Trade debtor days are down at 44 days now compared to 55 in the previous year. Again, we brought back customers and brought new customers on. We're negotiating tighter terms. So it's the new customers coming into the business. We've kept the assets under control. We've kept the debtor days. And finally, we're pretty good with our suppliers. We don't push the envelope too far. Um, our creditor days are at 39 this year. Um, a deliberate policy and that policy paid dividends. When we were buying those assets, we were able to get into that company, get suppliers back on board, a lot of whom were common with the business. They knew we were a good customer to them, and they were able to get the supply chain moving quickly and leverage that. So we have a deliberate policy of being sensible with paying our creditors, and that cash generation has not been at the expense of our suppliers. It's been a genuine cash generation in the air. Um, and a few out of date points possibly um, on, the, uh, on the sort of impact on the shares. As I said earlier, we're proposing a dividend of 0.23p a share. It's £139,000 to the business. Not accrued in the accounts, they'll be in next year's accounts, but if we'd factored that into the accounts, it would have given us a dividend cover of nine times. So a very cautious start. When we put this to slide together on um, yesterday it was based on the closing price on Monday and it was a 1% yield at that point for the day shareholders. It indicates the start of a journey this, it's not, um, you know, we, we do not necessarily consider ourselves a fully yield bearing stock at the moment but um, we're starting on a journey of rewarding shareholders who have been with us in uh, an income stream as well as a return on their uh, capital growth on their share price. Um, which is the final point there, is a, you know, 174% in the growth in the shareholder value in the last 12 months. Um, and we like to think we've seen, we've delivered on the uh, performance to uh, substantiate that growth. Okay, um, the end of my, my presentation, so I'll pass over now to Pippa. And thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, Great, clear presentation on the numbers, so that, that was um, no doubt the bit that most of you were here for. Um, but what I'd now like to do is take you through, if you like, the engine of the business and give some context to how we've delivered those numbers. And also we'll give you an idea of how we've got the business structured and how we're evolving it that will also help to drive growth for the future moving forward. So who are Crichtons? Bernard gave you a very top line introduction, but I thought just some facts might be useful just to kind of put it into context for those of you that have not um, been to one of our presentations before. Um, developer and manufacturer of personal care beauty fragrance and home fragrance products. We're a brand owner, creator and incubator. Um, very diverse customer base, which I'll talk through in a bit more detail later. Value, mass and premium. Two sites, main one in Peterborough. Um, of which there is about 220 of us and one now down in Devon, of which there are about 100 of us, so about 340 altogether. Um, we do a full service um, operation in terms of looking after our customers, which includes design, R&D and supply. Um, Award-winning products, again, I'll touch on that a bit later, that's key for us, uh, but also award-winning in terms of service awards with top retailers. And the reason we deliver those is because we have a mantra in the business and you could probably talk to anybody, any one of those 340 employees and they'd say quality, service and innovation are the three things that are at the heart of everything that we do. And as I go through the presentation, you'll see those themes coming up. So some history again for those of you that are not familiar with our business. Um, Crichton's actually bought the Potter and Moore business in Peterborough back in 2003. And there's a number of steps that we've taken on that journey to where we are today that have really kind of evolved and helped the business stabilise and grow, um, which includes diversifying our customer base. And I'm going to show you a comparison in a bit of where we were in 2003 and where we are now in 2017 in terms of how that has evolved. Um, we entered the UK discount channel in 2008 when the economy was tanking at that time. 
that was um, a very successful move for us, which we continue to trade very well. And again, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Invested more in our brands during 2009 and 2010. We ended up selling our share in Twisted Sister, which was a brand we traded predominantly in the US market in 2014. Sold the Real Shave Company brand in 2015. Acquired assets um, in 2016. And so far this year, we've launched a new brand called Feather and Down into Boots UK last month. Um, which is quite an exciting move for us in terms of continuing to launch new brands to market and bring innovation to market. Wanted to give you an idea of the um, category in which we operate both in the UK and internationally to give you some context of, of where we're at. We're very lucky. The beauty industry and the personal care industry is a very dynamic um, industry in the UK. 16% um, growth by 2018 in terms of what it's delivering. Um, what is very exciting, I think, about that is FMCG sales, 9.3 billion. That's growing too. And a large proportion of it is evolving into luxury product. So the consumer in the UK is buying more product, they're spending more money, um, and they want more premium product, which is a really good move in terms of our sector. Um, what's interesting there is that our premium sector in the UK is now larger than France and twice the, the size of Spain which were considered traditionally quite premium markets in beauty. Key drivers for us in the UK, channels are evolving. It's really interesting. Value is really important from the discount grocers through to the likes of um, Tommy Morris and Poundland, speciality and online. Um, as a result, independent brands have got greater access to market. The barriers are coming down. Online is driving that. Consumer and innovation is driving that. So that's very exciting for someone like us that are bringing new brands to market, that actually entry into the market is becoming easier. Um, consumers are seeking quality and value, a theme throughout everything that we do. It's a very high return margin category for retailers. So for example, Primark is a new customer of ours. We've developed that very well over the past six months. Um, and that's a good example of them wanting to take advantage of the margins that you can make in this category. And the market is driven by innovation. Internationally, very similar story worldwide, um, a $220 billion category, sorry, sterling category, 5% growth by 2018. Um, UK export values into international markets is 2 billion and growing. So again, quite an exciting dynamic. Emerging markets are seeking luxury. So a very similar dynamic with consumers in the UK is happening internationally as well. Um, we're very lucky. The UK is considered to be one of those key hubs of providing luxury quality products in toiletries, personal care and beauty to the international market. So there is a demand for British beauty. We're being asked by customers overseas to make sure that we've got provenance on the, on the packaging, that we have the Union Jack in England. It is definitely a factor that is driving um, export sales, which is exciting. Skincare and hair care are key growth categories. If you break the beauty category down, two very key categories for us. We do a lot of investment in both of those. Asia Pacific and Latin America are growth markets, and obviously the impact of Brexit. Um, the onshoring of manufacturing is also seeing the onshoring of resourcing by a number of the big retailers in the UK for UK manufacturing. So we experienced eight, nine years ago, a lot of manufacturing moving out of the UK in this category, and retailers like Tesco, like Aldi, taking product from the likes of Eastern Europe, that is all coming back into the UK. So their strategies are changing quite considerably in terms of supply and where they're getting that from. So how do we deliver? Um, as Paul highlighted earlier, we do not define ourselves as a manufacturer. We are much more than a manufacturer. We are actually a solution provider. Um, there are a number of things that we do that add value to all types of customers that we have, um, which enables us to define ourselves that way. So firstly, three business channels. I'll go into that in a bit more detail later a very diverse customer base. We have category expertise in 10 beauty and personal care categories. Buying power, a very key aspect of our business. So while that happens behind the scenes and is not necessarily something that our customers see, it is absolutely something that helps us win business and helps us keep that business. Flexible manufacturing, so low to high volume runs, very wide range of products that we can manufacture and we can handle lots of different types of packaging. That is not common to a lot of manufacturers in the UK and Europe. So that's something that we do offer to the market. And R&D expertise, very important that we get product to market on time when we say we're going to deliver it and that we have a very robust MPD process to get new product to market. 
So just to go into our three streams in a little bit more detail to give you a better understanding of um, where our revenue comes from, one of those is owned brands, and I'll show you how that's grown over the past few years, and that's brands that we own. Um, and the key features of that is that we can we place those brands in different sectors of the market. So whether that be in the value sector with someone like a Poundland or a Tommy Morris, whether that be with the likes of Tesco and Boots, or whether that be at the premium end of the market in the speciality retailers. So having your own brands definitely gives you the opportunity to play in all of those sectors. Um, very trend consumer led and innovative and speed to market. And our new brand Feather and Down is a good example of that. Big trend in the market at the moment for sleep and people that have sleep issues. Um, and as a result, we've launched initially exclusively with Boots in the UK. We've secured some great space. Um, and so far, things are going very well. But that's a good example of where um, we are reacting to a need that consumers have in the market, which I'm sure everybody in the room can definitely um, empathize with. Private label, this is where we um, design, develop and manufacture for private label brands that are owned by retailers. So that can be anybody from Asda, Tesco, Aldi, Superdrug, Boots, Morrisons, pretty much everybody on the high street and in grocery. Um, the dynamic here is, um, it is similar to what we do in our brands, but what is very, very important and absolutely essential for all of these retailers is our service performance. It is a measure and a KPI that we are we are measured on all the time and they expect you to achieve 98 to 99% service delivery every time they order something from you. You would be quite surprised <laughs> how even some of the big multinationals don't achieve this very well. And what keeps us in kind of top selection of supply to these big manufacturers is that we are able to forecast well, we manage our stocks well, and we order day, day one for day three in terms of looking after them in terms of um, making sure that stock is on shelves so that consumers can buy it. Um, big volume variation, super drug, big account for us. We can do 10,000 unit runs, but then you can do something for Asda in the baby sector where you're doing more like 25, 30,000 unit runs. So there's quite a, a, a spectrum of volume requirement from some of these retailers, which again, makes us very attractive to them because of the flexibility that we have in my manufacturing and the diversity of product that we can do. Contract manufacturing, this is where we manufacture for other brands. Um, and that's just a selection of the people that we are supplying and working for. Um, most of them are in the premium sector. Um, the way that we manage our business, A, in terms of that service performance, bearing in mind they then have to deliver to retailers. We understand retailers, so therefore we can help their business manage better because we know what they're having to deal with in terms of their end game. So service is very important. Um, what is something else I think we excel at here, where I say excel at accounts standard fillers cannot manage? Our competitive set in this arena is usually a shed with machines where you've got a couple of guys filling formulations and putting it into bottles and shipping it out. Great. <laughs> what a lot of these brands are now looking for is people that understands the dynamics of MPD, of innovation, of service, and can actually work with them in terms of what they're having to manage. Uh, technical expertise and backup that we give them. Many of these brands are going global, so therefore the documentation and the understanding that, that they are going to need to help them go into export markets is important, and we, we are able to do that. Um, so the contract manufacturing side of our business is much more than just filling, if you like, liquids into bottles and into jars. It's about providing that added value service to these premium retailers. We're now actually establishing relationships with some of them, we're now participating in their MPD. So they're now inviting us in to say, okay, well, what's your view of our brand? What products do you think we should be doing? Um, and in some cases, helping them with design as well. So that's a very interesting involvement for us as we're working through with some of these really nice brands. Um, as I highlighted before, wanted to kind of show you the journey in terms of how we're evolving our business. Um, this is in order to make us more robust, more versatile, more able to respond to opportunity. So when Crichton's purchased us in 2003, we had three brands, 25 SKUs. We now have 10 brands with 120 SKUs. One dominant private label customer, which was Tesco. We now have nine private label customers. We had only two customers in the value sector. We now have 20 plus, pretty much trading with everybody in the UK. Two multiple sector brand customers. We now have eight. 10 contract customers. We now have 30 plus. We were not trading in export at all. We're now in 30 plus markets. So you can see the journey that we've made in terms of diversifying our business, de-risking our business, and making ourselves more robust. Just wanted to show you again 
the involvement in three areas, the divisions, so 2003 private label contract brands, dominated by private label back then. It is now a more even split, and I suppose the thing to highlight there is that brands were only 6% of our business, they're now 26% of our business. In terms of our customer mix, we were dominated by Tesco back in 2003-2004 with 44% of our business that was all private label, no branded business at all. And you can see now that we've diversified quite significantly. We have no one customer that is more than 10% of our business. Um, and in fact, it was lower than that, but we've been very successful with Superdrug in the past 12 months. So that has pushed them up to 10%. So that's quite a nice problem to have. Um, and you'll see quite a different mix in terms of, of who we're dealing with. In terms of our categories, in terms of expertise, we were very much a gifting and bath and body business back in 2003. Two areas that we have absolutely um, deliberately gone after is skincare and hair care. Skincare now 31% of what we do, hair care 19%. That skincare dynamic is driven predominantly by the contract side of the business. So customers like Wren, customers like Bamford. Um, the hair care element is driven predominantly by our brands. So it does kind of fall into different categories. So a much more diversified set. The asset buy that we did uh, back in February of last year bought to us premium fragrance. It bought to us candles, home fragrance, gifting, and bar soap. So again, our capabilities in, in terms of product profile and product stretch is increasing all the time. Quality, innovation, and service, the mantra of our business. Um, the reason we keep these at the heart of what they do is because they keep us on track and they keep us focused. So one way of demonstrating to you about our quality is our consumer awards. We're big on awards. We win quite a lot of them. We've won three this year so far. Um, one for Humble Skincare, one for Ami Skincare. So again, both brands in skincare, which is great because that'll advance us in skincare. And then again, for three years running, we've won our beautiful brunette um, shampoo and conditioner, which means we've now entered the Hall of Fame with the Hair Awards, which is quite exciting. Um, so that's so far this year. So hopefully more to come this year. Consumer feedback. Um, again, is a measure that we have and we monitor that is a KPI in terms of measuring the quality of our, our products. Um, and we are very fortunate that we have lots of people out there that love our products. Innovation, very important, particularly when it comes to our brands. And I just wanted to demonstrate to you some of the things that we've done over the years, um, two of which are on there we have managed to sell on. So we were first to market with the three-step male grooming system with the Real Shaving Company. We were first to market with St. James, which was an all-natural male grooming premium brand. We were first to market 18 months ago with a brand that we have launched in Boots and we've now got in six countries globally with a range that is dedicated to people with curly hair and first to market with a luxury mass sleep dedicated range, Feather and Down. So these firsts are very important for us and it's about innovation. It's about getting consumers' attention. It's about bringing new consumers to our brands um, and again, hopefully, maybe engineering them for sale at a little later date. <laughs> um, service, I highlighted how important this was to private label and contract. And again, a demonstration for us of how well we do here is awards that come from retailers. We have won two so far this year, both from Superdrug, best service level and best supplier, which obviously was a great accolade. We have P&G in the room. They have L'Oreal in the room. <laughs> they have all the big boys in the room competing for these awards. And we've managed to win what I think are probably the two most important awards. So on a final note, I just wanted to give you a picture of what we're doing globally. It now represents 10% of what we do in terms of our revenue. Map of the world, um, green is where we are trading, yellow is where we are currently in negotiation. Um, some new markets that have come on stream in recent times are Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, um, and Peru. And very important for us in terms of our development, Germany. Germany, we have traded with now for about seven months, and they're now our fifth largest market in terms of exports. So that is growing quite dramatically. And obviously one of the largest markets in Europe, so a key one for us. We're exporting to over 30 countries worldwide. What I wanted to demonstrate to you here is that our strategy in terms of supply is um, one where we do try to go to the top one, two, or three in the market in terms of retailer. So we're quite specific in terms of our target of retailers that we want to go to. So for example, in Turkey, we're with the number two. In Chile, we're with the number one. Um, in Australia, we're with the number one and number two. So it's important to us that we go after those retailers in, in different sectors, and that can be in grocery 
and in the drugstore sectors. And that just gives you an example. I'm sure there are names up there that you recognize in terms of, of different markets. Um, the USA continues to be our number one export market. Um, we have traded with the USA for some time and it continues to do very well for us. Um, after that, actually, Turkey has just become number, number two. Chile is number three. What is interesting in all of those instances is we trade with those retailers direct. So whilst we do have some distributor models in some export markets, Russia, for example, our goal, where possible, would be to trade with the retailer direct. This is because we understand retail, we understand the consumer, and the dynamics of working with the retailer direct with our brands, we find, is actually a very positive way to develop. What we're also finding is that some private label briefs are coming out of some of these international retailers, which is interesting. So we have just delivered private label into Saudi Arabia, as well as our brands going into Saudi Arabia. Um, obviously a country that does not have a contract manufacturing base in this sector. Um, so is coming to the UK that is world renowned for doing these kind of products. So that's been an interesting development for us. So I just wanted to do a summary of key achievement, achievements so far this year in terms of calendar year, in terms of how we're trading. So Crichton's Hair Care in the UK now has a 2.7% market share in volume terms. So that would be some of the hair care products that you see here, our Crichton's brand. We're very excited about that. To even get on the radar of Nielsen data in terms of market share for a business of our size is a key step forward. So that's very exciting. And actually that's helped us engineer those products into Tesco, into Asda, into Wilkinson, so not just in the value sector, but also moved it into the mass multiples. Um, our brands are listed in discounts, mass market, and premium distribution channels. It's the premium channel that we've developed over the past six to eight months. The launch of Feather and Down into Boots, which is a pricing structure that goes from eight pounds to 18 pounds, so moving up the spectrum in terms of retail. Our contract manufacturing has extended from Boots to exclusive brands to fine fragrance and internet brands. And that's been a very interesting development for us. An enviable record of private label <laughs> development. We've developed two key retailers over the past six months, and that's Primark and Aldi in terms of private label supply. Two retailers that are very key at the moment in this sector. Extended our global distribution to key markets, with Germany now being the fourth trading market and growing. And we've won three beauty industry awards so far this year. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand you back to Bernard, who is going to do a summary for you. Thank you very much, Pippa, and thanks, Paul. I'm sure you will agree with me that I'm very lucky to have such good people leading our team. And believe me, that's just a part of our team. They, they, we're, we've got great uh, manufacturing people, great product development people, uh, a really strong team. And that's, that is uh, really what we're about. Uh, our good results demonstrates our strengthening and maturing management team. I just have to go to work and sleep or smoke dope or whatever else, but these guys can do it. And just in summary, we're well positioned to take advantage of the growing number of onshoring opportunities as far as manufacturing is concerned. Uh, we've, we've won some big contracts recently. Grace Coal, to mention one, would be equivalent to a million pounds. They used to buy from China. They've now re repositioned in, in the UK. Um, and we are the lucky uh, suppliers. Uh, our cash is good. We're generating cash. Uh, we have the resources now needed to facilitate organic growth. Um, as you can see from Paul's charts, our cash is building and I think we're using it pretty wisely. Our <coughs> we have a, an acquisition aspiration f uh, of a brand or a full business for that matter. But most of all, we're careful with our money. Uh, we've turned down several potential deals this year um, and probably quite a lot in the previous years. But I think what we do, we do well and have done well in the past. Um, our order books currently stands at 8 million. We've never had an order book like that before. It's a tremendous result and it's again a reflection of this team, how good they are and the team underneath them, uh, right down to the We've probably got 25 graduates in training who are great performing people as well. And that's our culture and outlook. Um, we, we feel proud that we're able to pay a, a dividend this year for our, our loyal shareholders. It's, I think, 
Nick, our company secretary, who's been with the company even longer than I have, is very proud of this moment because it always has been his aspiration. Uh, so, <clears throat> in summary, uh, and this is an, th these are our aspirations. We're an aspiration-driven company. We don't use budgets and plans as much as we use aspirations. <laughs> so, uh, we want to double our turnover by the end of 2020. We want to show at least 5% net profit after tax on the bottom line consistently. And we want to, we aspire to, and it's not a guarantee, but we aspire to pay at least a 2% dividend by, by that time. And we aspire to be uh, achieving a, a rate of return on capital of 20%. Um, I think we, we, our, our history shows we're pretty well balanced, we're pretty flexible and we're set to take advantage of all the opportunities presented to us. So I, I leave it uh, at that. I, I, and, and I think we're ready to take questions, are we? Um, unfortunately, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't hold the shares, but uh, it's a fantastic <laughs> story. Um, Thank you. done brilliantly, and uh, I like your, your aspirations there. Could, could you just talk about the operating margin, though? Is there a sort of natural limit at which that can get to, given the industry you're you're in, um, you know, four or five percent. It's a good question. Yeah, you're, uh, that's why we said it. I, I think the five percent is what you're speaking about. Yeah. 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 I think that's could a reasonable get, target. Yeah. Um, well, our policy is right to keep it. Keep it. We we feel that it's 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 wise to keep it at five percent. It could get to eight percent. I don't think it could get to 12 percent. Um, Paul or Pippa might like to comment on this, but we're in a very competitive market and we feel it's innovation and, and uh, the ability to be flexible and our, our service that drives it. But I don't think we're ever, ever able to extract a 12 percent bottom line from Tesco or Asda or Tommy Morris, as Pippa has referred to, who's, who's known as, as home bargains in, 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 in the high street. Um, but we are moving up the, 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 the channel to more premium uh, uh, levels and we would be, we would aspire to, aspire again, to launch premium, more premium brands which might allow us to get up I into the 8% or the 9%. I think I would, would, I would hold my breath on, I wouldn't hold my breath on 10% on plus. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, Doug Hawkins from Hartman & Co. A related Thank question you. to the uh, gentleman uh, asking about margin. I noted Pippa's point about the movement uh, from private label contract and brands uh, between the start period 2003-04. How does the margin differ between those categories and is that a way in which you can manage margin aspirations? Okay. I'm going uh, to hand over to Pippa because I don't want to hog the, the limelight here. The, the, Absolutely. The, the margins between those three categories you want to come up here? are actually quite yeah. different um, in so far as that private label where you're dealing with those very big multinational retailers can be squeezed. Yes. However, we don't do most of the commodity products for those retailers. We try and always do added value. We do a lot of skincare for those retailers. So we do manage to keep the margins healthy. We actually try not to compromise on margin too much. Our brands obviously can deliver a lot more margin for us. You know, I mean, almost double in terms of your starting point. Now it depends how much you invest in those brands, but obviously you've got a lot more control because we're masters of our own destiny in that respect, insofar as that, you know, depending on how we engineer the products and the costs that we keep under control or whatever, you know, the investment that we put in. Interestingly, contract manufacturing, if you're bottom end of the market, obviously the margins are, you know, you're working for pennies per product. We're actually more at the premium end of the market. And again, we want to, we want customers in that arena where we're adding value. Not only do they bring us better margin, but also they're more likely to stick with you because you're not as commodity. So if you look at people like the White Company, Wren, um, you know, some of these very added value brands that we're working for, they value the relationship a lot more because of what we're bringing to their brand, as opposed to if you like a P&G where they're quite happy to move you know, for 2P around the world, wherever that may be. So, yes. So, interestingly, contract manufacturing, if you're going after the right kind of customers, can actually bring quite healthy margins. And, and you didn't mention private label. How does that fit? Yeah, private, private, uh, private label, again, 
if we stick to the added value categories, it is a harder margin to try and pull out compared to brand and contract manufacturing, but there are categories within those retailers that you can, you can do margins. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. It does, thank you. Thank you. Um, while we're on this slide, I see you've got this aspiration 60 million in 2020. It sounds like organic growth has been sort of 10% a year. Yep. So if I just project that forward, and I know you don't do projections, but that sounds like you're talking roughly acquiring 20 million of turnover sometime. You know, what, what, what sort of things might you be looking to buy? Is it things like the Devon acquisition, i.e. assets, or are you, might you also be looking to buy brands, or, or what's the sort of limit mm. on what you might buy and what you might not buy? We, we, just, um, we just turned on or, or, or resisted the opportunity to buy a brand, a three million turnover brand, which is listed in Marks and Spencers. Um, the, the price was probably around a million, uh, and the turnover was 2.5 million. 2.5 million. It, it, it had complications within it, which which was all about the shareholders and the and the and the debts uh, shareholders that lent money. So we walked away from it. It was very tempting to do it, uh, even though uh, we felt it was slightly at the top end of the price market. But that's the kind of thing we would be. We we we've, we've looked at uh, Swallowfield. Uh, one of our competitors recently bought Brand Architects. Um, well, we made an offer for uh, that was a, a range of brands for which we made an offer of six million and they, they kind of paid a lot more for it. We, we, we offered six million and uh, a buyout after that, which would have equated to probably 12 million. And, and the condition was that the person would stay, the person who led the company stayed with the company. So uh, that didn't work. It wasn't you know, what they wanted. Uh, it was the same equivalent as, as, as Swallowfield probably in terms of overall cash. Um, but, uh, they weren't prepared to, to, to work with the limitations which we put on. And maybe we, they didn't just like us. I mean, you know, we're not very likable, but that, that's the way it was. So that's the kind of thing. Products came out of the blue, and it was, it was a different pr proposition. What we bought there was machinery, really. The company was gone. Uh, the employees had been made redundant. The customers had gone somewhere else. So we used the expertise of this, this team, this great team I have, to, to win back those customers uh, but what we got was the knowledge of the, the sector of the market they were in. The, it was a different sector of the market, and it was more premium. So we, we wound those, the white company, we wound them back, ran we wound back, and, and we're, we're profiting from that now. That's, that, 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 those are the kind of things we've gone after in the past. Hi, uh, can you talk a little bit about your innovation sort of uh, pipeline in terms, and also the origin of the innovation? For instance, you mentioned the feather and down. How do you start innovating product in the market? Do you start from tuning into the consumer mm. trends and then mm. develop a product for I it? I can't answer that question. Pippa never tells me. I just wake up one morning <laughs> and feather and down is there. So <laughs> There is actually no one answer. Um, what's very important in this sector is that you develop products that the consumer needs and the consumer wants. So absolutely trend management is core to everything that we do. And our contract customers know that we do that now, so I can see that they're logging into that as an added value service that we do. Um, ingredients in terms of what's coming onto the market is very important. Lifestyles, I mean, that's a lifestyle brand. It's a well-being lifestyle brand. It's just interpreted into toiletry, bath and body and home fragrance products. Um, so we're always keeping an eye on well-being and lifestyle and changes to what's happening to you know, people generally. So it comes from an array of sources and we travel the world in terms of trade shows in terms of the sources that we find um, and yes sometimes we do just wake up and come up with something and haven't told Bernard <laughs> mm. <laughs> that does happen sometimes um, yeah. but what's also important is we, we we look a lot at the premium market as well because you do have some very premium very niche innovators at the top end of the market that sometimes actually can't engineer bringing those products to market but you might see something and go we can bring that into premium, we can bring that into mass. So that's very important, keeping an eye on those as well, the kind of top end. So, so we're also keeping an eye, sorry, but, uh, we're also keeping an eye on the health side of, of beauty, where you, know, you, you can bring things out that improve, that, that heal scars or, or improve your feet or your soldier feet, whatever it may be. So we would, we would uh, we'd have an aspiration again to get into that side of the market more, a little more strongly, where the, where the margins are a bit, bit higher, higher. Thanks. Uh, hello, Darren Nathan Hi. from Hybrid. And um, 
a couple of questions from me. In, in terms of your capacity, in, in terms of people and your manufacturing f facilities, h how hard are you running and how much more do you need to invest to meet these sorts of uh, growth um, aspirations? A very good question, actually. Um, because, uh, as, as I've said, our order book has now stretched to 8 million. And that 8 million has to be delivered probably in the next three, three to four months. And we, w we, do, we do get recurring orders within that. So it's a huge opportunity for us. And, and this is the way it, things go in cycles, as you all, you guys know better than I do. And um, so we've, we've driven the sales up. Now we've got to get the manufacturing up. So we're going to be working hand to mouth for the next three months to make sure we, we provide that service. We get things out the door on time and, we, and, and, and to the right quality. Um, in the longer, we, and, and so Paul and I agree, we've got to think of ourselves more as a 40 to 50 million turnover company rather than a, a, a an X 20 million turnover company and put the resources in place. We have the, we have the cash to do it. Um, and what we're doing now is, is exploring the, the uh, higher level, more efficient manufacturing process. Paul, might you say a few words on that, Paul, because you're I mean, in it we, right up to the neck. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Come on up here and overall, the, 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 you know, we're working, so if I characterise it, a one and a half shift system <coughs> across the assets. So we've got plenty of capacity to expand the business with the assets we've got. But, but we do need to build the resources to cope with that. And we're conscious that we're going through an expansion period and we need to invest and bring people in to take that all to another level. We're also conscious that the market is tightening in terms of labour. And we do need to look at how we can automate a little bit more, but keep the flexibility that, that our customers demand. We're not, you know, we're not going to be able to run 230, we were talking earlier, two, 300,000 of one bottle. That's not the market we're in. So we've got to look at automation at a point that can take labor costs out, but keep flexibility, not have a four hour changeover between a production run. So we're looking at two aspects there. We're looking at expanding within the, the, the existing resources, looking at, well, three aspects I want to head to really. We're looking at expanding within the existing resources. We're looking at how we can make targeted investments to take labour out and automate um, uh, and keep flexibility there. Um, and we've also got assets. When we bought the business in Broad Oak, we've got assets. I've got some equipment and we're moving a mixing vessel at the moment from Devon to Peterborough. It was used four times in the first 20 weeks of this year. It'll probably get used twice a day in Peterborough. So we're rationalising the assets we bought, moving them to maximise their utilisation across the site. So there's still more to come out of that acquisition in terms of better utilisation of the assets we acquired, as well as making targeted investments to drive productivity for up. And, and you mentioned you've got an 8 million yeah. order book, um, which will mainly be done within the next quarter. Or, that better or, be done, yeah. Or, or, <laughs> <laughs> or, or so. Um, uh, you know, you've got, got a really diverse customer base and business model. Um, so it's great to have an 8 million order book. But beyond that, how do you see your visibility for the next year uh, on, on a wider definition? Because because you sort of you know you 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 know you know you know which customers order regularly and repeat. Some might have minimum commitments, and that's a, you know what you know. W would it be safe to say that that eight million per quarter is is nailed on, or do you still have to work quite hard to get up to that? So so uh, that so sorry. So what you're saying is, will the eight million continue from month to month to month? Yeah. Will we always have a no, I, I, I expect it certainly over the Christmas period to drop to, to what it normally would be, which is around 4.5. Uh, but um, to, 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 we've recently taken on the Hut Group, which is an internet retailer. It's not a high street retailer. It's an internet retailer. And their business is huge. And we're only, we're only the, the tipping point at the moment for them and for us. So that could develop into a two million pound business. We've got to make sure we, we, we deliver on time, we deliver the quality, we deliver the innovation and, the, and, and all the rest of it, which people will speak about. But there's no reason why Amazon wouldn't be doing the same thing and we couldn't go to Amazon and do, do that. I mean, I'm just I'm kind of exaggerating or, or, or blue sky, but 
there's no reason why Amazon wouldn't have its own follow the same thing as Hut Group. That they they are they are uh, internet retailers right across every sector, whereas Hut Group at the moment are in health and beauty, and probably aspire to be in every sector. But that that those opportunities are coming up, and what we do is hunt them down. You know, um, we're looking at licensing. I was I was with the BBC yesterday trying to trying to negotiate a license for Strictly Come Dancing. I don't, you know, Pippa doesn't want it because she thinks it's, but you know, we, we, we're not afraid to have our, our arguments about this. But if, if I can get that license and, and you know, they're offering other, like Planet Earth, Gardener's World, I think we've got the innovation and the, the ability to make those work and work for the BBC and work for us. But because we have such, such good results and because we're becoming a stable company, they're prepared to talk to us. It wasn't, you know, five years ago, we wouldn't have got, I wouldn't even have known where the BBC had its headquarters. Uh, I even don't know now. We were in uh, Woodley and apparently have about three different headquarters in London. But that, that's an example of what we're, we're, we're trying to do. There's a huge potential in gifting, which takes all of the different strands that we have and, and um, gets it out there to the, the, the uh, department stores and the, and the um, uh, garden centres, all, all, all the areas. It's, it's including Tesco and, and, and Asda and Boots. Uh, Boots are talking to us about, Pippa, you can fill in this in. They want us to help them with their all year round gifting. Uh, Boots are the number one gifting com uh, uh, retailer in the UK, probably in the world even, with Walgreens tied into them. Um, but their offering on all the year round gifting is very poor and gifting has become an all the year round phenomenon. People buy gifts more and more for school, leaving school, coming back to school, all the rest of it. And they want us to work with them in so far as we can. We're not the only ones working with them, but to help them uh, address this uh, gap in their, in their market on gifts. I don't know so if that I would be an example that that's not even factored into our numbers this year, but that's an opportunity that's... Are, are there numbers out there for you? Are there, are there any forecasts in the market? For us? Yeah. No. 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 But that would be so, an example so on that, that order book, for example, where that's not even factored into our numbers for this year. And it's an opportunity that's sitting right at our doorstep that obviously we're going to take advantage of. There is a number of those things happening. To answer your question about order book, Ben is quite right over the Christmas period, it will probably dip. But there's also lots going on that would deliver this year, potentially. We're, we're, we're looking at 33 million this year, probably as a budget. Uh, within that, that, you mentioned the hut and their e-commerce. I mean, e-commerce is huge in the, this space and, and growing all the time. Uh, do you or do you aspire to manage your own e-commerce channels? I definitely would aspire. No, no, <laughs> no not, not seriously. Not, not, that would take our eye totally off the ball at the moment. Let, let's be precise about that. We have a website. We sell, you know, we sell, we sell the square root of nothing on it. And we don't have any um, uh, plan. Uh, aspiration or thought to become a, a massive internet retailer. We may do next year, but right now our focus is on getting the hut group, maybe going along and talking to Amazon to see what their plans are, or talking to any other internet retailer we can, because we know there's a sector out there that we haven't even touched on, and it's, it's proven quite lucrative for us at the moment. Uh, just a question on, uh, there was a helpful working capital slide. I noticed this year that uh, while you've almost moved up 50% in revenue, um, it's, it's marked that uh, working capital has, or inventory hasn't really significantly increased. Um, stock turn you have down and trade debtor days. Could you give us some idea how those break down by your sectors, you know, by branded, private label and um, contract? Yeah, very broadly, the um, the, the best. Come up, Paul, do you want to come up? Yeah, sorry. The, the, the three sales channels people talked about earlier, by far the best in terms of stock turn will be the contract side, where we're making to a an order, largely as soon as we manufactured it, we we deliver the product to the customer. Um, the next would be uh, private label, and and again it varies a little bit, but private label would be the next where we and we typically and very consciously hold quite high stock levels for most of our private label customers because we want to make sure that we hit those 98% service level targets Pippa talked about. 
Um, and, it, and, it, it, and we don't want to miss any sales opportunities, frankly. We want to make sure the stock's going out the door, so it's very conscious of it. Branded would be slightly higher because we're now servicing quite a lot of markets, and those markets come with um, often label differentiations, etc. So, so we do need to hold stock to service some of those, and we do manage some of that with a post um, manufacturing process before going out the door. But the branded would have a higher stock to a lower stock to and a higher stock level than the other two areas of the business. Um, again, the, the on the on the on the data days. Um, most of our customers um, are very good at paying to the agreed terms, but it would be no surprise to hear that Boots have um, longer agreed terms than lots of other retailers because that's the nature of the beast. And the same with different retailers will have extended terms that are negotiated. The smaller contract customers were able to position ourselves to have a more, um, a more normal sort of debtor terms, trade terms. So it tends to be retailer rather than um, will drive that rather than necessarily private label or um, or, um, or branded on the on the data days and again exports will be often longer because we've got a shipment time in there and it's part of the trade relationship with export customers and um, there may be a longer yeah, just, period just there. On the, on the stock turn I mean just in numeric terms would you have a figure for what the worst would be or you don't really not, have not numeric hand. breakdowns? No, okay. have that to hand. No problem. Thank you. I just ask a quick question about um, labour costs, because we've got the minimum wage uh, increasing and issues uh, unresolved uh, regarding EU citizens. Labour costs. Um, the, 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 we, we, we worked out our average. We wouldn't pay anybody by the end of the year, any year, when you calculate the average after the bonuses are uh, or attendance bonuses, payments that we do make to our um, shop floor people, who are, who are excellent, by the way. Um, our, think our average rate, lowest rate of pay is 8.25 an hour. Now, we aspire to, to, to bring that up by efficiency payments and bonuses to more than nine pounds, because that's the right thing to do. And we feel that by putting in more efficient, which Paul has kind of outlined in a way to you, Put in more efficient machinery, and uh, we will be able to do that. You like to comment? Is it, does that sorry? Does that answer your question? Yeah, you've got no concerns about labour shortages. We do, we do, we do, we do. Okay. We'll just move to, to the south of Ireland. No, sorry, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, undoubtedly, the uh, post-Brexit labour situation is changing. Um, we're in a market where there is, um, w anecdotally, and certainly evidence we're seeing, is that fewer East Europeans are moving over, um, and they have been 40% you know, of the workforce in the, uh, on the shop floor in Peterborough and an even higher percentage in, in Tiverton. So there is a risk associated with fewer people moving into the country to, to do the work that, that we've looked for. And that's one of the reasons we're looking at some of the automation, but we have to keep it flexible to keep it, make sure we're not over automating uh, and end up spending more time changing over or more cost changing over than we do actually running the lines. So we're looking at a flexible automation process. We're looking at where we can take, take some labour out. There will be a, a, a tightening of the labour for both reasons you mentioned, really, there'll be a tightening of the labour pool, and there'll be a tightening of the, um, the the increase going through with the national living wage going up, and the aspirations the the government has there. Um, to date, we've managed that. We've managed our margins well, over the two years that's been in place without any serious deterioration, and we're we're, we're working towards continuing to do that. Hi, um, can you talk a bit more about sort of your brand strategy and how it works in terms of sort of building up the brands and selling them and, you know, when they come to you or do you decide it's a, sort of the right time to sell? Yeah, brand strategy in terms of our own brands? Your own brands, Okay, yeah. yep. I think I better pass this over to Pippa, but we, we are opportunistic. If we see a trend in the marketplace, we'll try and get ahead of it. We watch, you know, Pippa, you better take over. You know. What we're very good at and we recognise as one of our strengths is we innovate, 
we design very well, we can get the retailer's attention. We're also very good at sales in terms of getting as much coverage for that brand as possible into as many retailers as possible. That Twisted Sister brand that we sold is a good example of that. We managed to get that brand through our sales force into almost every retailer in the United States, which made it very attractive for purchase. So in terms of how we brand build and brand strategy, there is an op opportunistic element to it because we're innovating and we're, we're moving forward with new ideas and Feather and Down is a really good example of that. In fact, just to tell you, Boot said that's one of the most in innovative brands they've seen in the past five years that's been presented to them in the luxury bathing space. And we're up against some big boys in terms of that. So they absolutely just snapped our hands off to take it because they're looking for innovation. So what we will now do is capitalize on that. We'll get it into more doors. We'll get it into global markets. Now, it's the point at which, and Real Shaving is a good example of that, do we then, if somebody approaches and said, because you, you get it to a point where it makes it very attractive to somebody to want to buy because you've got coverage, that is then the opportunity. That's why we define ourselves as a brand incubator, is that actually we're very good at innovating product, getting it into the market, and then there's the potential to sell on. We may keep one and build it bigger. We may not, <laughs> it all depends. But so there is a there is a bit of an opportunistic element to that, but we, we definitely are strong at getting product to market and getting it into the market. Where we take it from there is is really is the next well, that's Swallowfield that bought the real shaving company. It was Swallowfield, yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. yeah. And they approached Are you us. From it wasn't for sale, they just <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yeah, they, they yeah, they, so they, they approached us. They, they approached us and said, Yeah, we'd quite like the brand and we went, Okay, well this is the price. <laughs> there's, there's an interesting point here. You know, Pippa picked up a trend on charcoal, for example, charcoal hair care. And we launched uh, we launched the charcoal range into into T J Morris uh, Home Bargains and it sells like hot cakes. I mean we, we've made good money out of it. We're in a hundred, with Feather and Down, we're in 180 or 143 yeah. boot stores. Yeah. We will, we sell about 0.2, 0.3 per store per week. That's the way you measure these things. So there'll not be a lot of money. We would have to, to really get this brand to take off. We should really spend 250,000. That goes back to the margin question. It's easy to make a margin on the, the lower level brands because you, you just go for turnover in discounters and in, in Tesco. The real, what Pippa refers to as equity brands, which would be our Curl Company, our Feather and Don, our Ami, one or two others. You really need to spend a lot of money on them, and, and, and we, we do that cautiously. You, you know, we could make this a very successful brand if we lashed out 250000 in the next, uh, and spent it wisely. But in another way, it would be foolish because we wouldn't make 250000 even though it becomes a worldwide brand, it would take maybe three or four years to do that. So we'll wait and see how it, it anyway, it's exclusive in Boots for the next six months. So we'll wait and see how it, that uh, works out in Boots. Boots does get the attention of global markets. Yeah, it's a good reference <laughs> You're point. You're in Boots, you got Click South Africa, you got Priceline Australia, suddenly, so we use Boots as a shop window because they are the best in the world at what they do. So then it's yeah. quite right. So we'll leverage it that way. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. How many of these are you selling in the boots? Um, we've been in store for five weeks. We are, on average, when we're not on promotion, we're selling about five and a half thousand pounds at retail a week at the moment on that. When it was on promotion, that doubled. So, yeah, I suppose in terms of units across 11 SKUs, we're selling about 600 units a week, if that answers the question. Okay, I, I've been an investor in the company for three years. You first presented at my event in Peterborough. You've done it twice more where I've come to see you. And I don't like to embarrass people, but I will do. Um, I'll just say, Pippa, you've done a really good job. You present really well. And nothing today has changed my view that management is so important. You're doing a great job. Anyway, what I will say, though, is new brand here, for one thing, um, I'd not heard anything about it. Maybe maybe over the last few months, somebody's doused my pillow with some feather and down and I've been asleep, but uh, I'd not heard anything about it. So great news, but it'd be good if, you know, maybe the investors got to hear about it in some way. I don't know how you're going to do it, website or maybe just an RNS every so often that you've got a lovely new product out there. It's good to let the investors know. But anyway, the other thing I'll mention today, great results, but clearly the market has shot the shares up. Over the last couple of days, they went up. I'm always a bit embarrassed when share prices go up so significantly on results. It's as if you've done a poorer job on the way because you know maybe trading updates, broker coverage, PR, something should have helped you get nearer to that price if the results are gonna be so good. 
So it's just a bit embarrassing. But anyway, key for me now is order book you've mentioned, 8 million. It means nothing to me unless I've got a good idea of where it was at exactly this time last year. So where was it this time last year? It was less than four. I, I said our normal order book would be around four and a half million. This time last year, it would probably be less than four and a half million, probably. I couldn't tell you exactly. But th th those are the kind of dimensions we're talking about. Our order book at the m moment is twice as much as we would uh, have expected. And therefore, it's putting a strain on our resources to manufacture and clear it through. We will meet that uh, challenge. And we will, we will then budget for a higher level and make sure we, we uh, accommodate a higher level of manufacturing. And do, do you plan to have broker coverage out there so that investors can get an This That's what this is all about. We, 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 didn't, we didn't want to put our head above the parapet in previous years. I mean, you, you, you uh, guys who are investing kind of forced that a little bit, but we weren't under any real pressure from our previous shareholders to do anything in, in that nature or to, to, to use brokers or to, to, to look for investors. Um, I, I, you probably know the background, David, that, that my, uh, William McElroy is the, the, uh, key, was a key shareholder up until recently, until you guys came on board. So now we feel it's appropriate to start using corporate PR and to start putting our head above the parapet a little bit and to talk about our aspirations. Yeah, it's just that you might at some point want to a really significant um, purchase of another company and you'll need your share price in the right place. But anyway, but that's not, not to worry about. I, I, I don't understand your point. No, no, you, you always want your share price to be at the right level. Otherwise, you know, eventually. If well, what you are you saying? It's not at the right level? No, no, I have no idea. I don't, I don't value it on a daily basis. Okay. But to go I, I know, yeah, okay. You know, to go up so much in, in a couple of days, obviously it's helping. But uh, the, the other thing is online sales. We've mentioned the hut. Have we any plan to do a significant move in our own online no. selling? No, I, 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 I did say that before. Our focus is on developing uh, the, the high street brands and, the, uh, and, and to sell our brands or do brands for high street retailers. I think it would require quite a, an investment for us and a change of direction and a change of marketing strategy to do, to do that. I'm not saying it sh we shouldn't do it, but right at this point in time, we don't have a plan to do it. And, and uh, we don't have money set aside to do it because I think it requires quite a lot of money. You stress the benefits that have come to you from the Broad Oak asset acquisitions. How much also have you benefited from the Brexit vote and the fact is, I think Pippa was saying that manufacturing is being brought back to the UK. Yep. Good question, and, and I'll let Pippa and Paul comment, but I did quote Grace Cole, which, which uh, is, a typic is a typical, uh, uh, typical brand owner uh, who would normally buy from China, and they have relocated totally into the UK. Um, I don't know if they've put all their business with us or not, but we've got probably a million pounds worth of their business. Um, I think the fact that the Hut Group and other people are coming to us um, is an indicator of the insecurity that there is around importing from China in this Brexit uh, period of, of, of uncertainty. The were actually, they've bought brands that were manufactured in Canada and they've bought it all back to the UK. Well, not back, they've bought it to the UK. So that's another example. Do you think there's more of that process still to play out that you're going to pick up a benefit from? Without question. I believe yeah. so, absolutely. Do you have numbers for what percentage of the personal products segment here in the UK is offshore manufactured and what percentage of that could flow back? That's a good question. We good don't. Question. I haven't got those we numbers. don't. No. It's a good question. Mm. Uh, and, and we will set about getting some of that um, because information. Because just reverting to the gentleman behind me who was asking about uh, your share price and of course you're going to, you know, to fund growth and to um, provide for growth aspirations, you will obviously want a supportive shareholder base. And of course, I, yes. I think with this sort of background, that pretty much will, will, will come with the results. Um, but of course, 
you've been a relatively small company, and yet what we're feeling here, I think, and I speak for myself, maybe not the room, but what I'm feeling is that you've got a very big opportunity to address. And you've climbed up a certain level of scale and credibility, which is now what you're capturing with uh, many of the transactions and the contracts you've been talking about. But there is also this opportunity from Brexit, uh, which could see a lot of manufacturing shifting to a firm like yours. Yeah. And you'll have to scale up in all sorts of ways to meet that challenge. Yep. We, we intend to do that in all sorts of ways. But... but Mainly in, in terms of, um, well, I, I'll give you, an, Paul can comment on this in a second. I'll give you an example. We have filling machines, basically we fill bottles and, 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 and jars and, and tubes. So that's what we do. Hey, you're a solutions provider. We're a solutions provider, <laughs> okay. But to be a solutions provider, you've got to fill bottles and tubes. And we use machines which probably fill them at the rate of, uh, Theoretically, they can work at 60 a minute. They actually average we, what we call the black hole. That averages at about 40, 35 to 40 a minute. By the time you, you, you change over, you, you have breakdowns, you have little things to adjust. So we're looking at machinery now which can, can work at an average of 100 a minute instead of 30 a minute. It means that you can do the same amount in half the space, in half the time. We get rid of shifts. So we're looking at that. that you know, the, these machines cost 250000 so if you buy one, it's, it's a major investment, but we will do that. We want to make, now make sure we get the right one and the one that with the least change over time. Paul has, has done quite a lot of research on this, and we are about to embark on that program. So, so we are addressing the issue, um, and we want to make sure we see more and more of the Brexit coming this way as well. So, you know, it's, it's, we walk carefully. I think we're, we, try to, we try to be careful. It mightn't meet all your expectations we might move fast enough but i think we move i i think we move at the right speed paul you want to comment on yeah no, no I, th I think you've covered the point about the looking around at trying to increase the output speeds and maximize the return you know we've just got to try and do that as bernard said flexibly to cope with our variety of products um, but there's certainly people out there in that market who can supply our needs um, you know, we've just got to justify that from a payback perspective, etc. Um, but there's lots of opportunities there to to drive capacity through the business and take um, and more automate what we do to enable us to meet the opportunities that will arise um, through through a bit of reshoring that's going on at the moment. It's just at 250,000. You know, we have 10 lines, so you, you you know you could really replace those 10 lines with 2.5 million. But I don't think we want to go that far right at this. Although we could afford to do it, I don't think we want to go that far until we see the whites of the eyes of the Brexit effect. Does that answer the question? Which may be delayed now. Pardon? Which may be delayed. Which now. may be delayed. Yeah. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, one for you, Bernard. Um, okay. the, the lease. Um, where are we? And um, and then one for Pippa. Other categories. I'm thinking lipstick or anything like that. The lease. Yes. The lease. Okay. With William. Well, we we have a, our landlord is our 30 percent shareholder, or 29 percent shareholder, and it's in his interest to make sure we have the, we, we we replace the lease. And I don't think there's any any uh, the delay on that is our delay because I was. You know, if you've got so much cash and you really don't want to go to shareholders for money unless you really have to, unless they're kind of forcing the money on you, um, we may have the opportunity to buy the the, fact, the, the land and the site, but he, he, he wants to sell the whole site. I mean, I don't want to discuss, you know, something that's privy to him and the negotiations we're going through too much um, and don't want to give you the wrong impression. But I, I suspect we have the option to buy that whole site for a certain price, which may not be the price we want to pay, although it would, uh, you know, in terms of money, if we paid, say, five million for the site, the site, we'd have 11 acres. We wouldn't need all that site, and we could probably sell some of it off, but that five million would cost us what, uh, in terms of interest, maybe 250,000 a year if we got a good deal with the bank, whereas we pay 400,000 a year in rent now. So there's a benefit there, but the, the money you would pay for that, I'd probably, if there were a good brand came along, I'd rather pay the four, the four million for a good brand and, and increase our turnover 
rather than buy and just lease, you know, put a, I think what I, what I might do is go for a, a five year extension on the lease if he's, if, he's, if he's prepared to discuss that. We haven't, we haven't got into, but any delay in that is down to us. We, I, I, I want to keep my options open right to the last minute because we. Pardon? Return on capital employed if you did buy it, which wouldn't be so good. It, it would just, uh, well, it would, it would use up the cash. I mean, the cash is weakening, our, uh, 2 million cash is weakening our rate of return on capital. So it would immediately, and we would reduce the costs. So there would be a, I'm not sure that it would reduce our, our would it not improve our rate of return? Okay. No. Pardon? Yeah. So, um, yes, absolutely, looking at other product categories, you mentioned lipsticks, that's colour cosmetics. Colour cosmetics, in all honesty, would not be a category we'd move into in the near or medium future. Technologies for manufacturing that are very different in terms of what we're able to do and, and the capabilities that we have. Um, also dominated by a lot of big brands, that's a very high entry category to get into for smaller independent brands. However, with the asset buy, we're now moving into fine fragrance because we acquired that capability in terms of the machinery that we now have in Devon, which some of it is moving up to, to Peterborough, specifically cellar wrapping, for example, cartoning and cellar wrapping, which is very big in the fine fragrance category. Also candles, home fragrance, um, and bar soap, which is making a bit of a comeback, interestingly. <laughs> it's all to do with free from and people not wanting parabens and nasty things in their products. Soap doesn't have a lot of those things. So you're going to see that category of product come back in quite an interesting way. And we have the ability to manufacture that. So there's four new categories that we're moving into already. And we've already engineered it into Feather and Down. So candles and reed diffusers and room fragrances are already in Feather and Down. So does that answer the question? <laughs> OK, great. Are there any other questions? You referenced a, a possible acquisition for, for six million, which ultimately went to Swallowfield. Uh, what well, were your expectations of how you would have funded an acquisition like that in terms of, say, cash, uh, debt facilities, and equity? A good point. It was we were over six million, uh, and we had a, we had a few. Uh, uh, our our key shareholder was prepared to put up at least thirty percent of the the six million, and and. Um, uh, we would have probably gone to shareholders on that one, but um, I think that by, you know if, if we would have gone to shareholders because we wouldn't want to stretch to leave ourselves in a position where we had no money to to actually function and, and have a working ca a decent working capital facility. But um, it was mainly the we our key shareholder was very supportive of the idea and was prepared to put up a couple of million. Didn't you say your key shareholders got twenty nine percent? Already, yeah. so you would have needed a, a comp, uh, takeover whitewash. Sorry, you would have needed a whitewash for potential takeover because you'd have gone over thirty percent. Yeah. I, I think. Sorry, I can answer that. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah. The situation would have been that he he might have give, given the company a loan, so it wouldn't have been equity, or more likely it would have been a a rights issue, and being a twenty nine percent shareholder, he would have had take up 29% of the uh, rights that were issued, which is the third that Bernard was talking about. That, that's, that's actually what he proposed. I wasn't yeah. saying he was going to put two million in on a, on a company. Yeah. But if you've got a shareholder who's prepared to put two million up as part of a rights issue, it's a fairly, a fairly good place to start, I think. And that's, what, that's the benefit of, of, of um, having that kind of shareholder who's, who's also your landlord and, and probably creates problems for you in that sense. But that, um, but we, we also have, uh, you know, uh, we've unused uh, facilities of about four million, three and a half million in terms of bank loans and bank facilities and invoice discounting, as well as a one and a half million, at that time, probably one and a half million in cash. So we, we weren't really, we just didn't, you know, we'd probably prefer to go to shareholders rather than to leave ourselves really tight on cash and tight on working capital. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Just a question for Paul. Is FX becoming an issue, management of FX risk? Um, it, we, we have, um, we have a, a currency exposure um, and uh, we are net sellers of dollars. The way we trade, Pippa mentioned, we're trading into the US. We sell in dollars in that market. 
We've got a net buy, we're net buyers of euros with the nature of the market. We're also indirectly exposed, particularly to the euro, because there's some of the traders in the raw materials side of the market are traders in the UK, but source the chemicals from Germany in particular. So we do have a, 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 an exposure. The way the currency's moved over the past year post-Brexit is we've had a, a cost increase on our euro denominated, but actually a gain on the um, dollar denominated on the income side. So we have a little bit of a natural hedge as long as they both move together. Obviously, it's either way, but we're not massively exposed in either area. Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a real pleasure. And I hope we've answered your questions adequately and, and given you some comfort on your investments <laughs> or potential investments. Thank you very much. Thank you.